remember it like it was yesterday. And, uh, and now we live in Florida. And uh, I did marry my childhood sweetheart, met her when I was five years old. That's a true story. She was my next door neighbor at the age of five. We got married a short time after that because we were living in Texas. And this is what, anyway. <laughs> People often say, how old were you when you got married? I said, we were so young when the minister said, you may kiss the bride. I was like, gross. <laughs> anyway. It's not true. Um, got married at 18. We're celebrating our 26th wedding anniversary this year, which we're very excited about. And uh, we have two kids, a 23-year-old son and 20-year-old daughter, and they both work at Disney World, which is where we live now. Not in Disney World, but pretty close. Um, they, they both work there, and, and that's sort of a halfway answer to prayer because we always prayed, God, let us have kids that are servants in the kingdom. And... <laughs> We just were never real specific about which kingdom that was. So when you're praying for your children, be really specific because God has a funny sense of humor like that. Now, we're, we're really privileged uh, uh, to, to be there at Pastor Church in Celebration, Florida, a little town just south of Disney. It's, a, it's the town that Disney built 23 years ago. And uh, so I pastor Celebration Community Presbyterian Church. I'm not a Presbyterian but neither are most of the people in my church, so it doesn't really matter. So I uh, just don't want to change the name. Anyway, no, I, I get to serve on a, a teaching team as part of that church, and then they're really gracious of letting me travel around. And once a year, we try to get up here to the Midwest and, uh, and be home with family and attend uh, reunions and all those things. And so when I got uh, a call from Diane, I just finished this book, The Forgotten Way, with Ted Decker. We released it last year, and um, a few months ago, I, I got this call from Diane. She says... Um, she filled out this form online as people were inviting us, and I, I've got enough more invitations than I know what to do with, but there's this one obscure invitation to Cottonwood, Minnesota. And I said, Mom, isn't Cottonwood near Marshall? I remember Cottonwood growing up, and uh, it, just, it just gripped me, grabbed me. I thought, my goodness, we gotta, we've got to make this a priority, so... It's fun. I get to, get to pick and choose where we go, and it's really an honor to be with you. I, I really feel like we're not here by accident. I feel like we're just here to encourage you, and I understand this church is going through uh, a, a transition. So I think our timing in coming here and encouraging you is, is really important. I, every now and then, I like to I just pray for specific things and specific people. And when I do, oftentimes, um, uh, just a picture will come to mind. Uh, you do this too. Maybe you just don't realize what's happening when you're doing this. You understand when God created you, he made you in his image and likeness, and he gave you an imagination. And imagination is, is that limitless canvas upon which a limitless God can begin to create a perspective, a destiny that, that he wants to unfold for you. Life and people all around you will try to hem you in with boundaries everywhere and, and tell you what you can't do. But the Bible says all things are possible with God and all things are possible with him who believes. So in that place where you're surrendered to just believe what God believes, you realize your limitations are actually the same as his when you're moving with his heart. And that's why the imagination is such an important thing. It's not a spooky, weird thing. New Age does not own the imagination. It actually belongs to children. You don't have to teach a child to have an imagination. They just do. And I don't think it's any accident that Jesus said, unless you become like little children, you can't even see the kingdom of God. I think he was saying, you have to awaken yourself to the possibility of dreaming beyond your own perspective of your limitations. And so uh, this morning, as I was getting out and just walking toward the church, just praying, saying, God, is there something specific and unique to speak over Swan Lake Church? And suddenly, in my, just in my mind's eye and imagination, I just had this picture. It was a picture of a bread box. I don't even think of bread boxes. I like food, but I don't think of bread boxes very much. And inside that bread box, there was like a stale loaf of bread, as if you've left it in a bread box for a long period of time, and what was once fresh now becomes stale. And, uh, and the interesting thing was, and this all happened within the course of a matter of like two or three seconds, but it's, it takes longer to unpackage than that. And immediately the first thought that came to mind was, well, how do you rejuvenate stale bread? Well, there's a lot of different ways you can you could do it. You can take a dish of water and put the bread and the water together in a microwave and zap it and all these things, but that seems awfully complicated. But then beyond that, I felt like, I saw like the hand of God reach into this box, and just when he touched the bread, it went from being old and stale to new and fresh immediately. And then I heard the words, I make all things new. 
all things new. All things new. I'm thinking this morning, if there's anything I can encourage you with, it's this. God wants to reach in and touch every life, not just every life in this room, but every family in this room, every heart in this room, but also collectively this entire congregation. And when he touches something, he takes that which has maybe gotten old and stale and dry from our perspective. And it's not that he just restores or regenerates or rejuvenates something that was once old. No, he goes in and he actually takes and makes it as if it was completely new all over again, all things new. He's really in the business of making all things new. He can restore lives and marriages, and and, uh, he can restore bodies and churches to a place where some of you may remember when this church was built. I wasn't around. I know no story about this church of when it was built. You may remember the excitement that happened when this church was built. Most churches do have a level of excitement that happens when a, a new building comes in, a new pastor comes in, whatever happens. But You can't necessarily go back and revisit it other than in your mind. What I want to tell you, though, is this, that if you'll surrender to the touch of God and and what's been sung about this morning, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. If that's really the cry of your heart, I can guarantee you every Sunday, every week you gather, every time you gather to pray at 8 o'clock in the morning, every time that you gather various ministries around this church, look for the newness, look for the freshness in it. God wants to restore uh, some, some old dreams that you stopped dreaming, some old prayers that you stopped praying. And uh, I can guarantee you, things won't be the same as they were before, but they can be much better than they've ever been. And that's the nature of the kingdom, that the kingdom is always increasing and advancing and moving on. And, 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 uh, and glory to glory is kind of the trajectory of the way things are with God. And so I'm very excited for you. Any church in transition has the potential to explode with a whole new season of growth spiritually and numerically and in every kind of way. So before your pastor, the next pastor that's going to take this church even gets here, begin to pray for them. Pray for them. Even if you don't know their name, pray for them because God knows who they are. And and in your prayers, you're preparing an atmosphere where when they step in, they'll feel the presence of God and they'll know uh, exactly what they're supposed to release from within them to impact this body. Does that make sense? To two of you, that makes sense. Good. All right. All right. We're off to the races now. I am really glad to have uh, Mom here. If you've followed along with Faith Mountain Ministries at all for for any number of years, you'll recognize Mom's name. My dad, uh, Henry Vanderbush, uh, passed away about four years ago. Did anybody know my dad? Anybody know of Henry Vanderbush? If you ever met, met him once, you never forgot him. He, uh, he was the most unusual, unusual man I ever knew. Um, honestly, one of the most awesome and unusual people. And it seemed like things just happened to my dad. My dad was in Oberammergau, Germany one time with a group of friends. He'd take people on missions trips. And he took a group of, of young men over to Germany, and they went to go see the Passion Play. And uh, I don't get to tell this story very often, but I think it's to be fun. Uh, they're sitting in this church on a Sunday morning, as was their custom. Wherever they happen to be in the world, they just go to church that morning. And as they're sitting in this church, of course, everything is in German. And, and it's a lot of stand up and sit down and kneel and stand up and sit down and all that. And my dad's friends say to him, Henry, what do we do? We don't understand any German. What? And dad says, just sit next to this guy. We're going to do whatever this guy does. And so they stand up, they sit down, they just kind of watch what he does. And of course, the sermon drones on and it's in German. And, and uh, if eventually, the guys kind of nod off a little bit, and they're really not paying attention. And all of a sudden, this man stands up. And so my dad and his five friends all stood up as well. And this guy turns and punches my dad, just hauls off and hits him. The ushers come and grab my dad and his friends and pull them out of the church. Now they're dragging them out of the church on a Sunday morning, kicking them out of the church. And my dad's saying, what do we do? What just happened? What's going on? And the usher says, you're not German? Dad says, no. He says, we're Americans. We don't even speak German. We have no idea what's happening. And the usher starts to laugh. And he says, when he finally composes himself, says, they were doing a baby dedication this morning and asked the father of the child to stand. <laughs> so... That was my father. 
always someplace he wasn't supposed to be, doing something he wasn't supposed to do. But in the course of his life, he led thousands and thousands of people to Christ. And, and after much demand on my mom, she finally caved to write a book about the story of my dad's life. It's called The Miraculous Journey of Henry Vanderbush. There's only a handful of them left back there. We've uh, just been doing a week-long series of meetings in the Northwoods of Minnesota. Then one other thing I want to mention is um, there's a couple of USB thumb drives back there, flash drives. This is one of them. It's called Project 24. And uh, it's 24 hours of teaching on identity. 24 hours. Um, somebody said to me one time, Bill, you've got so much teaching on identity, I bet you got an entire day's worth. Ah, no, I don't. And then they showed the archive of all of the messages I preached on identity from different angles, and it amounted up to 24 hours of teaching. So um, they put it together on a thumb drive, and it uh, looks like this. It looks like a business card, but it's actually a USB drive. And those are back there as well. There's a gift. So um, there's also another USB drive back there. It's 12 hours of teaching. I'm walking both in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, the presence of the Holy Spirit is with you. Anytime you turn your, turn your heart of attention and affection toward the presence of God, he's with you, and you can be aware of him. But the power of the Holy Spirit is, is what God in Christ has called us to actually walk in. That is the thing that releases the kingdom of God from within you to make an impact on the world around you. And that's an awesome thing. So 12 hours of teaching on that back there, 24 hours on identity. If after 24 hours of identity teaching, you still don't know who you are, go talk to Diane. She'll, uh... all right. Uh, if you take your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 22. I want to uh, just briefly this morning do a, do a, a short teaching on three chapters of Scripture. <laughs> We're going to try to get through three chapters in a very short amount of time. Bible scholars will tell you that King David wrote the Psalms kind of like any songwriter does. He wrote them in blocks. And that is, um, like if David had a really bad month, you might get five very downer Psalms in a row. If you don't think there are downer Psalms, if you don't think there's really, really depressing Psalms, you haven't read the Psalms. Every human emotion available to humanity is available actually in the Psalms. You can see in David's heart, he really is all of us at some point in time or another. And in this case, every now and then, David tapped into something that I would say has an ultra supernatural edge to it. By that, I mean a prophetic edge where he was writing beyond his own day. So he was writing things that wouldn't have made any sense in his time at all, but things that make perfect sense now. And this is one such case. Psalm 22, 23, and 24 are a trilogy of sorts. And it begins in Psalm chapter 22 with a very famous verse that goes like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now when we think of those words, David is usually not the person that comes to mind. Who made those words famous? Jesus. He said these words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, because of this phrase and because of the way that we've taught it in Western culture, we've built this theology that essentially says that the father turned his back on the son on the cross. Now, that sounds really poetic, and actually it sounds really nice because we can all identify with rejection, and it's nice to know that God in Christ identifies with our deepest rejection. But if you ever have a young person come up to you and say, hey, besides that, where does it say God turned his back on Christ on the cross? And you start looking through the scriptures to try to find where that is, you're going to have a very difficult time finding it because actually it's nowhere else in the Bible. And the craziest part about it is you begin to realize what was happening there. It starts to unfold this thing of the goodness of God to you in a whole new way. And the reason I say that is because it's really a big deal that you catch what was actually happening there. Jesus wasn't saying, God has forsaken me. He was quoting Psalm 22.1. And if you're standing there at the foot of the cross, and, and you're an Israelite at the time, and you're hearing Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You wouldn't think, he thinks he's being forsaken of God. You would recognize that phrase as Psalm 22, 1. And if you're thinking, why is he quoting Psalm 22? Suddenly, 
you go back and revisit it in your mind. It's like quoting the first line of a popular song lyric that everybody knows the song. Now you can recite the entire song in your head. And this is exactly what happens if you're a Jew standing at the foot of the cross and you hear him quote Psalm 22.1. Now you're thinking the entire psalm. Why would you know the entire psalm? Well, because you didn't have the internet back then. You didn't have movies. You didn't have a whole lot of stuff to do other than learn the scriptures, which Jews did. And most Jews would have known the entirety of the Psalms by heart. Here's an interesting line in Psalm 22. It goes like this. They've pierced my hands and my feet. For my garment, they cast lots. If you're at the foot of the cross and you hear Jesus go, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You think, wait, that's Psalm 22, 1. And suddenly you think of the lyrics of the song. What's happening is going on right in front of you in graphic detail. Pierced hands and feet, casting lots for his garment. David could have not possibly known the ramifications of what he was writing when he felt led to write Psalm 22. As a matter of fact, you say, well, Bill, I thought that God really forsook Christ on the cross. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you want to take down a note, says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And the way he did it was by not counting your trespasses against you. It's a beautiful picture of the fact that the Father and the Son were actually in harmony in your reconciliation. Now think about how awesome that, that message is. That means that it wasn't like God going, I'm, I'm going to destroy these guys. And Jesus goes, oh, please, Dad, don't hurt them. I, I, I'll stand in the way. I'll, I'll take all the punishment. I'll take, that's not the way this thing works. Father and Son were absolutely in full harmony in your reconciliation. There was no dysfunction in arguing within the Godhead about whether or not you should be reconciled. They were completely on the same page. As a matter of fact, if you want to go even deeper with it, Psalm chapter 22 and verse 24 says that he has not turned his face from me. Now, this is a fascinating part because now we begin to realize, wait a minute, but it sure looks like at the beginning that he feels forsaken. Here's an important point. There's a big difference between feeling forsaken and being forsaken. I think all of us at some point in time in life will pray a prayer that doesn't get answered in the timing or the way that we want it to. And in those moments, you can feel forsaken, but it's really important to understand that just because you ever feel forsaken doesn't mean you are. And what begins with Psalm 22, 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Suddenly, the writer says in Psalm 22, 24, he hasn't turned his back on me at all. He hasn't forgotten me. He's not turned his face away from me. As a matter of fact, if you want to take a look at this, you realize that this is, the, this is a picture of the cross. So we understand the, the death part and the burial part, but you understand what the resurrection part actually accomplished on the cross? Take a look in Psalm chapter 22, all the way toward the end, starting in verse 27. Look at the ramifications of this amazing prophetic word. It says, all the ends of the earth will remember me, turn to the Lord, and the families of nations will worship before him. The kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship, and those who go down into the dust will bow before him, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. It just simply means somebody who does no power to save themselves. Look, take a look at the last part here. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people that haven't even been born yet, that he has done it. And take a look. The first words of Christ on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's the last words of Christ on the cross? It is finished. That's Psalm 22. Some translations of the scriptures will actually say in the last part of Psalm 22, the words rather than he has done it, will say it is finished. So Psalm 22 is an amazing prophetic picture written in David's day about what was going to happen to Christ. Now, you take a look at that, and you begin to realize, I mean, it's, it's so clear. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. But now it leads us into Psalm 23. The Lord is my... Isn't that funny how we all know this one? I shall not. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside 
So you guys know this. As a matter of fact, I bet we could go all the way to the very end of this thing, and you would know this thing by heart. Why? Because you heard this in Sunday school once. It just stuck with you, and you never forgot it. It's fascinating how Psalm 23 just sticks with us. It's got a beautiful poetry about it. But Psalm 23 is not just a nice piece of poetry. It's part of a prophetic trilogy. We've already seen the first part. It's a clear picture of the cross. If Psalm 23 is a picture of what the cross accomplished, or Psalm 22, then Psalm 23 is a prophetic picture of what life is supposed to look like on the other side of the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die for you. He died as you. Galatians 2.20, Paul said it like this. I got crucified with Christ. Co-crucified is actually the word there. I was actually crucified with Christ. It's not even I that live anymore. Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in this flesh, I just live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When Christ died for you, he died as you. He took you with him on the cross. When he got buried, he got buried as you. He took you with him into the grave. But here's the best part. When he was resurrected, he got resurrected as you, both with and as you. And now Paul and John are obsessed with this idea of being in him, in Christ, It actually restored us to God's original intent for us, and that was to have a communion, a relationship, a face-to-face communion with us and God. So now there's no distance or separation between you and God right now. Yes, right now. Psalm 23 is a picture of what life in that union looks like. And I want to go through it with you. I want to Hopefully you'll see Psalm 23 a little different, and it'll bring it out of sort of this historical context into the moment that you're standing in, and you'll realize how empowering this actually is. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Okay, so I am beginning this by surrendering to the lordship of the good shepherd. That is it. He desires to guide me in everything that I'm doing. He is really interested in everything that concerns you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It means that in that place where I am surrendered to the lordship of the good shepherd, I'm lacking in nothing. No lack at all. The next part. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. This is called rest. If you're taking notes, this is one of the first notes you should take. That that is, the Christian life always begins in rest. Always begins in rest. Now, that doesn't make any sense to us because typically what happens in our mind is we think, well, I work, I, I labor, and rest becomes the reward. That's what I get at the end of the day. We don't start with rest and from God's perspective, he goes, you know what? Here's the way this goes in the kingdom. We're turning it around. And, and the way I feel that like he says it to me, as, at least as it pertains to Psalm 23, is, hey, Bill, you can voluntarily lie down in green pastures, or I can make you to lie down in green pastures. But one way or another, we're going to begin this from a posture of rest. It's not a place of, of apathy or, or uh, uh, just complacency. It's a posture of total surrender so that as he begins to work in your life, you can't take credit for it. And if you can't take credit for it, there's no pride involved. What happens in us is he begins to produce gratitude from a posture of rest. Let me say it like this. Nothing that you ever get from God will come through striving. It first comes through surrender. We begin with rest. But we don't just stay at rest. Now he takes you by the hand and you begin to walk. That's the next part. He leads me beside still waters. Now this is a fun one because think of it like this. In this natural world, we have wind and waves and circumstances and issues and problems and stuff always coming against us. You remember the time that Jesus was in the boat Common Sunday school story. Jesus is in the boat, and the storm arises, and it's threatening to overturn the boat, swamp it, and sink it, which apparently Jesus calls this nap time. And the disciples are terrified, and they wake him up and say, are you not afraid that we're going to drown? And Jesus 
looks at the waves and says, peace, be still. And he shuts the waves down and everything gets calm. And then he turns to the disciples and says, how come you don't have any faith? And the idea is this. Listen, I enjoyed the wave machine. If you wanted to turn it down a little bit, you had the power to do it. And the reality is the disciples didn't realize who they were and they didn't realize what authority they carried. When you begin in rest, you are empowered to walk, releasing peace around you everywhere you go. It means now that the circumstances and the issues around you do not have the power to affect the world within you. Why? Because the world within you is greater than the world around you. Or we could say it like this, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ in you empowers you to literally walk, releasing peace everywhere you go. Now, the circumstances around you begin to shift and to change. Why? Because you began in rest. I'm surrendered to the good shepherd. I'm lacking in nothing. In him, he's my everything. And now I begin in rest, and now I'm walking in peace. The next part goes, he's restoring my soul, or he restores my soul. The soul is typically defined as mind, will, and emotions. And we're just going to leave it at that definition for today because of time. Now, in that place where I begin in rest, I walk in peace, my mind, my will, and my emotions are restored. By who? By him. He's doing this. <clears throat> when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he accomplished something that you and I never could. And that's why Psalm 23 says over and over again, he leads, he makes, he restores. Every step of the way, he is the one that's doing the work. You and I are just along for the ride. This is called grace. And it is more amazing than we've ever known. He restores my soul. So what happens? I begin in rest. I walk in peace. My mind, my will, and my emotions are restored. The next part, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, righteousness, this is the part where we think, I'm going to go out and do things that are good, that are going to impress God. That's not the way this works. Righteousness has nothing to do with things that you do to impress God. Righteousness is purely the byproduct of a surrendered life. If you could do something to impress God, then you could take pride in what you've done to impress God. But let me give you something really, just let this sink into the soil of your heart. God had made up his mind about who you are long before you had the chance to impress him or disappoint him. He told Jeremiah something fascinating. He said, I knew you before I even formed you. Which means you could actually be known before you knew you could be known. He knew you before you knew you. So the question then is, what does he know? Because what he knows is who you really are. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Now righteousness purely becomes the byproduct of a surrendered life. He leads me for his name's sake. Next part, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This is where we get kind of frightened because we go, oh no. I signed up for this Christian thing to get out of the valley of the shadow of death. I don't want to go back into it. Are you kidding me? I thought everything was going to get good. No, that's not the way it works. He doesn't promise you that you're never going to enter the valley of the shadow. What he does promise is that you're not alone. And so now he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be brought into partnership with fear. Why? Because I'm not alone. You're actually with me. You're with me. Why does he allow us to walk into the valley of the shadow of death? So that you can discover that death is nothing but a shadow. It can't bring you into a place where you're partnering with fear. Why? Because you're not alone. Next part. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I don't know about your house, but in my house, the rod and the staff did not comfort me. Oh, come on. This is Minnesota. You guys had to have grown up the way I did. We're in a different world nowadays. Anybody under the age of like 16 knows nothing about what I'm talking at this point. But if, you, if you're anywhere hovering around the age of 40 or above, maybe the rod and the staff in your house did not bring you a ton of comfort. You know, the worst spanking I ever got in my life was my wife's fault. 
it's true. Dad had put up a brand new fence. We, we lived in this uh, downtown area, uh, this downtown neighborhood in Austin, Texas. Dad had put up a brand new fence because the old one had been bent down by the neighborhood kids. The big high chain link fence bent the thing down, stood on top of it, and used it as a trampoline. We bounced on this thing until pretty soon it was bent down. Dad was so upset. He went and got a new section of chain link, brought it out, and he puts it up, but he didn't put the bar across the top yet. Missed that piece. And he looks at me and he says, Billy? If I catch you climbing that fence and bending it down, so help me. And he didn't even need to finish the sentence. Tracy came over, looked at the fence. New fence, climbs up there, starts bending the thing down. New fence, a lot of bounce, climbs up on the fence. Now she's bouncing, now the thing is bent. Now, I didn't do it, but that doesn't mean I can't participate in what has been done. This is my logic. A lesson that I learned very quickly. It's a very bad idea. I climbed up on the fence because I didn't do it, but hey, it's bent. We're having fun. We're gonna, I'm jumping up and down on this fence. Tracy hops off just as my dad opens the door and sees me on the fence that he had just told me not to climb on. Worst spanking I ever got in my entire life. And it was her fault. <laughs> so I married her. Here's the thing about the rod and the staff. The rod and the staff represents the judgment of God. I could talk a lot about this, but I don't have the time to do it. But here, here's the way this works. John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus makes a stunning statement about the judgment of God. He looks at the, the, the teachers of the law. He looks at the Israelites. He looks at people he's teaching. And he says, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. And then later on in John chapter 5, he says, don't think I'm going to accuse you before men. You have an accuser. Moses is your accuser. And essentially what he's saying is, if you suffer under the weight of judgment, it's only because it's your own self-inflicted condemnation you guys are giving away to each other. But my father's not judging you, and you know what? Neither am I. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And this is such an important point. Because most of the time, we think of judgment, we have a hard time differentiating between the fear of judgment and the fear of punishment. Judgment from God is actually on your side, not against you. Why do I say that? Well, when we pray for the sick and we see somebody healed, what you've just seen is the judgment of God against the injustice of infirmity coming against your life. Let's say you're needing a job, and we pray, and God miraculously provides a job for you, and suddenly, you, man, you're able to provide for your family. What is that? That's the judgment of God. It's called blessing against the injustice of the thief that seeks to steal and to kill and to destroy. The judgments of God are actually for you and not against you. That's a big deal to understand that. And when you catch that, you realize the rod and the staff, they comfort me. Why? Because it offers protection. Not like you're waiting to just get smacked every time you do something wrong. Now he's actually for you and not against you. So let's go through the pattern. We begin in rest. We walk in peace. Mind, will, and emotions are restored. Righteousness becomes the byproduct of a surrendered life. In the valley of the shadow, I have no fear. And now the judgments of God are for me and not against me. Next part, you prepare a table before me in the presence of of my what? Enemies. Ooh, don't like that one. God, I have an enemy here. They, they want to hurt me. Why are you cooking dinner? You're supposed to be building a wall, not cooking. That's not a political statement, by the way. What are you doing? You're, there's, a, there's an enemy right in front of me. Why are we setting a table? Because God knows who that enemy is. And the only reason that enemy is your enemy is because the enemy doesn't know who they are. They don't know they've been made in the image and likeness of God, and they've gone blind to their authentic identity. And perhaps the table is being set so that you can invite that enemy to sit down and across the table discover that he's actually your brother. That you become a living invitation for that person to begin to see themselves through the eyes of God and let the Father begin to redefine Define how that person has seen themselves their entire life and even redefine that relationship so that what ends up happening is your adversary starts becoming your advocate. 
This is how lives are transformed and changed, is when you can look beyond a person's status as an enemy and begin to realize, wait a minute, nobody can be my enemy without my permission. When Jesus is standing in front of a bunch of persecuted Jews and he says, love your enemies, he's not talking to a Western superpower with the biggest nuclear arsenal on earth. He's talking to people who are systematically being executed just because of their nationality. And he looks at them surrounded by their enemies and he tells them a most offensive statement. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. And I don't think he's telling them to passively let the world just roll over them. I think he's revealing to them that the most powerful weapon you ever carry will never be one that you hold in your hand, but it's one that you have in your heart. It's the presence of the love of God that actually can change the heart of stone in an enemy and turn them into a brother. That's the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Next part. He anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. The anointing of the head with oil is something that belonged only to priests. Priest means somebody who has a face-to-face relationship with God. That's what you're meant to have. My cup runs over is something that belonged only to kings. That's the divine provision that just flows over and over and over. You're actually blessed so that you can be a blessing to others. Oftentimes Christians will say, well, I don't care if I'm, I'm poor. I just need just enough to get by. Well, as believers, we're actually supposed to help the poor. Might I say that being poor is a terrible way to help the poor. God wants to fill your life with an abundance so that you have a generosity, an abundance to give from with a spirit of generosity when he calls for it. When, when a missionary comes to town, when, when somebody comes into your life and you know that they have a need, God has actually resourced you to be able to sow into someone else's issues, someone else's need. God is actually wanting to resource you so that you can be a blessing to the people around you. There's a place where you give from in generosity where it's kind of painful. But you know what? There is actually a place where you can go to in giving where it feels amazing. Giving until it actually feels really, really good. Tracy and I become addicted to this. It's just like tons of fun. We just love giving. It's just, it's great. So you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. The next part, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I picture it like the wake of a boat going out behind you. Everywhere you go, goodness and mercy are left in your wake. Maybe your your life has been a wake of destruction. A lot of people's is. Picture, beginning in rest, walking in peace, mind, will, and emotions restored, righteousness being the overflow of a surrendered life. In the valley of the shadow, I don't even partner with fear. God is for me and not against me. My enemies are becoming my friends. I have a face-to-face relationship with God and he's filling my life with provision to be a blessing to others. And now, goodness and mercy are just a natural overflow of everything that we're doing. And the last part, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. What's the word? Forever. Everybody say forever. This is a big word. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A Messianic rabbi told me one time, It's actually a really weak translation. He says what it should say is this, and I will be the dwelling place of the Lord forever. That's kind of cool. In the Old Testament, it would have made much sense, but in the New Testament, it makes perfect sense, especially when Jesus says in John 14, 20, in that day, and the day he's speaking of is the day where he's gone to the cross, gone to the grave, beaten death, and the Holy Spirit has come upon the church, which has happened. So then that day that he's talking about in John 14, 20 is right now. And he says, in that day, you will know I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Can I tell you why you're alive? God has created you in his image and likeness to be the home, the dwelling place for his presence. That's why he made you. Because he wants to live In you and me, putting himself on display. It doesn't make you God. You're not God, my goodness. He's not you, but he has created you to be the dwelling place of his Holy Spirit. That's kind of amazing. That means it is he who defines us. 
We don't define ourselves in our own mind. We don't come up with our own identity in our own mind. We don't make it up by looking in the mirror and saying, who am I going to be today? We don't ask our friends, who do you think I am? We don't ask everybody around us, who do you say that I am? We ask that question to one source, and that is God. Who do you say that I am? The one who's known you from before the foundation of the world. And then begin to let him define how you do life in this costume. That's what it means to live a life surrendered to God. In Psalm 24, and starting in verse 1, and we'll just stop right there, he says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell in it. Think about how we started this in Psalm 22, 1. My God, you've forsaken me. I'm feeling alone. Psalm 24, 1. Everything belongs to you. You are everywhere, and there is no place you can't be found. You own it all. How do you get from that to that? you realize we're on the other side of the cross and now you're living life from Psalm 23's pattern of living on the other side, the resurrected life. Let me finish with this story. People often ask, Bill, you talk about God as if he's really good and I've never seen God that way. I get this a lot. I've never seen God as good. I've just always felt like I had to worship him because he's God and what choice do I have? Might I tell you that God is absolutely better than you think? And you can't imagine him better than he is. Here's a story I think that illustrates it best from the scriptures. Paul and Silas are in jail one night. They got thrown in jail and it was unfair. Totally unjust. And yet at midnight, Paul turns to Silas and says, Hey, let's sing something. Let's sing that uh, You Make Me Brave song. That one's good. We like that one. And so I, I don't know what they sang, but they sang something, right? And so they start worshiping God in the middle of prison, in the middle of the night. And as they worship God, you guys know the story, you remember this from Sunday school, an earthquake comes and shakes the jail. And the prison doors open, chains fall off. That's kind of cool. Here's where it gets offensive. The prison doors opened and the chains fell off of everybody. Now imagine this. This is a prison, a Roman prison in which there are actual prisoners, people who did really bad things. There's murderers and rapists and thieves and and all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of people in this prison. Not everybody's in there unjustly. There are real genuine criminals in there. And yet, God comes in and everybody's chains fall off and everybody's doors open. I think maybe modern churchianity would like to rewrite the story a little bit and tell it differently. It would be more convenient for our self-righteousness if we could tell the story like this. And at midnight, Paul and Silas sang praises unto God, and an earthquake came, and God opened their doors and shook their chains off as a testimony to all of those heathens how God treats those who get it right. This is not what happens in the story. In the story, everybody's chains fall off and everybody's prison doors open but that's not even the craziest part the craziest part is that nobody moves nobody goes anywhere the philippian jailer runs in and he looks and he sees doors wide open and he just thinks i'm I'm so dead and he grabs his sword and he's going to end his own life and paul stops him and says don't we're all here and the question needs to be asked at this point if you're guilty And suddenly your chains just fell off and the door is open. Why don't you run out into freedom? Well, you don't have to if freedom just ran into you. This is what the gospel does. You don't get the gospel. The gospel gets you. Maybe this morning you're hearing this message and you go, I I don't fully understand everything I'm hearing with my mind. But maybe you're one of those rare people where as you're hearing this, something is coming alive in your heart. What that is, is the Holy Spirit of God, the freedom of Christ running into you. You Bill, you don't even know what I've done. Jesus starts his ministry in Luke chapter 4, 18. When he starts it, he quotes Isaiah, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel, to proclaim good news and freedom. And he mentions two groups of people, captives and prisoners. To set captives and prisoners free and to set them at liberty. The two groups of people are very important because they represent all of us in here. 
captives are in bondage, in some sort of chain, some sort of unforgiveness, bitterness, whatever it happens to be, self-doubt, a lack of, of any sense of worth, a, a, a hatred of, of self, a, a, a pattern of, of lifestyle that's self-destructive. Captives are held bound oftentimes because of what somebody else has done. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't your fault. The abuse wasn't your fault. The, the theft wasn't your fault. The words and the slander weren't your fault. Captives are now held bound because of what somebody else has done. And for those people, it makes perfect sense. We need to set those people free because that's just not fair. But there's another group he mentions, and it's prisoners. And the definition of a prisoner traditionally goes like this, that you're in captivity, you're also in bondage, just like a captive, but the reason you're there is because it is something that you have done. It is your fault. Nobody else is to blame. It's your responsibility. You're stuck in bondage, and nobody else had anything to do with it. It's all on you. And Jesus looks at humanity and says, whether you're a captive or you're a prisoner, I've got one word for both of you. Freedom. I don't think he's so interested in how you got into the chains or got behind the bars. Whatever those bars are fashioned out of, guilt, shame, judgment, whatever. I don't think he's so interested in how you got there. I think he's far more interested in setting you free because it's in the context of a grace filled freedom that you actually discover who you really are and who the Father has always known you to be. Bow your heads with me this morning. Listen, I know all over this room there's people that are struggling with a sense of guilt, shame, under the weight of judgment or punishment. A couple of things I want to tell you. You're on the other side of the cross now. And as such, the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to live the resurrected life. And maybe you're in a place of captivity to unforgiveness and bitterness, own sense of your loss of worth because of what somebody else has done. Or maybe you're suffering under the weight of guilt and shame because of your own sin, something that you have done, and you just can't, can't seem to shake that. And this morning, I want you to hear the words of Christ. I'm here to proclaim freedom to captives and prisoners. So Lord, I pray right now that you would do a quick work in the hearts of every person in this room. God, may your love just be ignited within them right now. Father, may they become aware of your presence on a level that they've never experienced it before. And Lord, as they go about their days, may you begin to give them a, a, a sanctified imagination so that they can see what you see, hear what you hear, speak what's on your heart, and release your spirit and life everywhere they go. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to invite you just to do one thing. <clears throat> just put your hands out in front of you just like this. Just pray this with me. Holy Spirit, fill all of me with all of you. I welcome your freedom. I welcome your liberty. I welcome your spirit into my life. Awaken me to see as you see. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for calling me your child. I trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today.